Uh, we're very lucky to have Greg Guerin, who's the Senior Global Product Specialist for First Trust Global Pro Portfolios. Uh, he's responsible for the support of First Trust's expansion into the UK and the European markets. Uh, Greg is a graduate, as I mentioned, of the Booth School of Business, where he received an MBA from the University of Chicago with concentrations in finance, economics, and international business. Uh, prior to working in London, Greg was a member of the First Trust institutional team, uh, and currently he's been speaking on and presenting First Trust US economic views uh, and ideas to a wide array of audiences. Uh, Greg is known for his energetic style, uh, passionate, and uh, data-driven approach. Uh, so we really appreciate Greg uh, joining us today. We also want to thank uh, Will Click, our, our local First Trust representative, for putting us in touch with Greg. Um, I know as as we've kind of faced uh, Brexit and and looking at the sort of ever-changing world of, of uh, European markets, you know, the the team in London has been a great help. Um, so Greg, really appreciate that and. Uh, Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say in your presentation today, and um, I think uh, Syl and I will will kind of drop off here for the presentation, and then we'll rejoin you at the end to to ask some questions and have a little bit of a conversation then. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, just seeing that I can share my screen right now, just making sure I'm sharing the right screen though. So. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, hey, Keith, I really agree, um, but don't tell Brian that I, that I agree that, um, oh, we've got this one here. Can you, just double checking, you can see the screen? Yep, we can uh, see the screen, at least I can. Uh, it says 20, macro outlook, just double checking. I can see it. Excellent. Keith, I agree. Booth, University of Chicago is better, but don't tell Brian because uh, our chief economist, Brian Westbury, also went to Northwestern. So uh, let's just make sure he doesn't hear that I said that. <laughs> uh, many of you will know, Brian, our whole team at First Trust tries to be data driven. And so what we want to be clear about is some of the issues in the market. And normally I have a, a Millennium Falcon backdrop here with a digital Back, background. So um, notice we've got some nice pictures from my, my kids over here. And that uh, right over there is my first trust fantasy football Super Bowl trophy. So let's just jump right in. I want to make it as, um, as engaging as possible. If there are questions, uh, Keith and Co., if you want to interrupt, please feel free. I'll just walk through a couple of uh, prepared remarks of what we're looking for this year. And the long story short is higher volatility, lower returns. And I don't wanna make that sound as negative as it is, but let me kind of explain. Um, the higher volatility is because we've had a very, very low volatility. A gigantic part, part of that, the reason for that is the what the Fed has been doing, both post the financial crisis and especially in the last 24 months. But it's also just, we've had very low vol years and we should expect higher volatility. I'll show you a slide on that in a moment. So. This volatility we're feeling in January is slightly elevated to a traditional January, but I think it, it's at least a re-education in beta. We'll cover that in a couple of minutes. The lower returns isn't meant to sound as negative as it is. This year, in fact, we're predicting a 70-year average return of 11%. So a price target of 5250 on the S&P 500. However, we always like to get um, better exposures, whether it's across the different areas of your portfolio. And so with respect to this, I just want to highlight, we're coming out of, I love this picture. It's one of the most accurate pictures we could see is we're coming out of a period where it's very clear to see, but also not a great, not great weather. That's the last two years, especially since the vaccine announcement. It was pretty clear. You could have bought just about anything and you were going to make some money. But now we're heading into this period of uncertainty. And as the uncertainty increases, volatility tends to increase. And a perfect example of this is the midterm elections, which we all know the closer and closer and closer we get to that, the louder the clanging gong is going to get out of Washington. But because the uncertainty is set to increase, we simply want our clients to be looking across the growth value. And please don't forget core, 
landscape to look for as much certainty as possible. So on the value side, we really want to make sure our clients are, are getting dividends. On the core side, we love return on equity, which is quality. And then on the growth side of the market, I believe the most certain areas of the market are anything touching the digital revolution and the energy revolution. And that is where we're looking for uh, our equity investments. Now, let me walk you through a couple of reasons why we're so bullish. And what I mean so bullish, not necessarily the magnitude, but the confidence. So here's a couple reasons. This is one of my favorite charts. And what it does is it takes after tax income and it puts it in the denominator. And in the numerator, you have financial obligations. So this would be rents, payments, insurance, property taxes, things like that. And so what you can see is after federal and state and local income taxes are taken away, the obligations, the things we have to spend on are the lowest they've been as a share of our wallet in the history of the data set. In fact, after the great financial crisis, which was a massive refinance for anybody that was able to, or a foreclosure for anybody that was unfortunate enough to have to do that, we saw that settle down here, then enter in the Trump tax cuts, and you can see this drop off a little bit, but then if, if you were told that we would do these stimulus measures and uh, send out three checks last year and the year before, and that people would actually pay down their debt. Would you have believed them? I wouldn't have believed them, but they did it. I, it's amazing. I, I'm still blown away that that's what happened. And so what we have is the US consumer, where the US GDP is two thirds consumer spending uh, in the best position they've basically ever been in. So Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan said, this is the best US economy, best year for economic growth that he's seen since the Great Depression. Um, and we'll get to one of the, his forecasts in a second. Another one thing I want you to know is that the net worth of the US consumer from end of 2019 to the end of 2021 is up 22%. And that's across income percentiles. So the poorest Americans earning the zero to 20th percentile, they saw their net worth increase about 10 to 15%. The middle three or four saw their net worths increase in the 20s. And of course, the top 1%, the rich get richer, they, they saw their net worth increase by about 30 uh, to 33%. But across the board, the US consumer is 20% more well off. And I'm going to show you another check on that in a second. Another thing to look at is the after tax income, if you subtract real consumption and expenditures, that number is two thirds of GDP. So that is a huge number. I think it's about 14, 15 trillion dollars. What's happening after people have paid their taxes and consumed everything that they want to consume, they were left with one and a half trillion dollars last year. Part of that were the stimulus measures, but this year the forecast is to be between one and one and a half trillion dollars. That number, to put it in context, the total value of the S&P 500 is 30 trillion dollars. And in a 24 month stretch, Americans are going to be given from their employers uh, and then pay taxes, then consume everything they want and just be left with two to three trillion dollars. Absolutely amazing. One of the reasons for this, and in my opinion, the biggest tailwind that's driving the US economy is this housing market. And so actually, before I get there, I just wanna show you as it relates to the 2008, then nine, 10, 11, 12 recovery from the great financial crisis. What happened was because people's homes went down in value for all the obvious reasons, they were more reluctant to sell. Because of what happened in the banks, there were fewer people able to buy, there were fewer, fewer banks willing to lend, a whole bunch of reasons that the housing market locked up and its effect on the economy was, was pretty, uh, pretty strong. So all we'd have to do would be to show you that we can remain stable from 2019. But in fact, as you all know, we saw a spike in 2020 and we've held the 2020 gains in terms of what's happening in the housing market. Let me put some numbers on this. So you can see right here, sales are down 2.3%, but look at this, 6.3 million. So you got 6.3 million houses are being sold on an average uh, for uh, at a run rate for the year at $350,000. That value is two point, I'm gonna make it a little bit clearer here, $2.2 trillion. $2.2 trillion is being unlocked. When somebody buys a house, 
Somebody else is selling a house. So that is liquid grease, if you will, in the US economy that is much more often an intangible asset. But 86% of homes are selling within a month. 22, or sorry, 2.2 trillion is just about 10% of GDP. This is a massively important number for the US economy. It is more important than the stock market in terms of the average consumer and what it means for their life. Now, you'll see this 350,000. At the end of 2019, it was 275,000. So if you just look at this, that's $75,000 is what anyone who bought a house in 2019 effectively has in their pocket, an extra 75,000, where if they sell that and then turn around and leverage that at the bank with a 20% down mortgage, you're talking about $375,000 of buying power that has been created on average just in the last 24 months. Now, if you wanna argue a good chunk of this is from inflation, we're not gonna stand in your way. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but this is so important as to the net worth of the American consumer. And after everything we've said, we still have more money in money market mutual funds than we did at the peak of the great financial crisis. This chart is, blows my mind. Okay. Now, I want to be clear. The S&P was about 700 at that point and is about 4,700 today. But still, it's $4 trillion. So you got another one and a half to $2 trillion just to normalize here. Then you add in, in the next 12 months, we're expecting a trillion dollars of stock buybacks. The buy the dip mentality is real, but because of the rising interest rates, which we are going to talk about in about five minutes, people are a little bit more volatile, a little bit more worried about some of the tech part of the market. And so maybe instead of a three to 4% buying the dip, maybe people are gonna wait for a 5% pullback and that, or, or maybe even a 10% pullback, just like his, historical standards, five to 10%. Um, correction, and that's a typical thing. That happens just about every year. Um, you can ask your team at, at Walker Condon. There's an amazing chart that First Trust puts together, and I've seen it from so many other asset managers. So it just shows calendar year returns and entry year declines. So we have sizable moves all the time for every year with uh, pretty good returns moving forward. But I think if you can put this together, a trillion in stock buybacks, four and a half trillion in cash on the sidelines, 2.2 trillion flowing through the US economy, after people pay their taxes, buy everything they wanna buy, they've got a trillion, a trillion and a half left over, no wonder we're talking about inflation, right? Now, every company is talking about inflation, people are talking about inflation, and our chief economist has been talking about it as early as possible. He called inflation as not transitory on July 7th. Um, this chart doesn't show it as much, but if you see how many times the Fed called it transitory until they called it persistent. Oh, actually, this is we did get that chart. So you can see how resistant they were to call it persistent. And if you notice, this is, you know, you got this line going like this, and all the forecasts are that it's going to come right, right back down. So just really quickly, remember the reason why people are nervous is because of this 1965 to 1980 period. Very quick historical lesson. 1965, you have the first inauguration year of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he was he took over obviously after the death of John F. Kennedy. So you have the vice president of a famous Democrat president becoming uh, president. Sound familiar? He then engages on fighting an invisible enemy and trying to solve local inequality issues. The invisible enemy would be the Vietnam War, local inequality issues. Does this sound vaguely familiar to trying to do Build Back Better? and uh, fight the coronavirus. Of course, you can't make these things up. But we're not gonna blame Lyndon Johnson because you can see actually it's only a slight pickup there in the, in the inflation. It's when Nixon gets in here that things really start to take shape. Bretton Woods held all currencies fixed to each other. And this is more important for us international expats, by the way, I live in London. Uh, we've got Bretton Woods holding all currencies fixed to each other and really to the US dollar if the US dollar would be backed by gold, which it was until it wasn't. And they broke both of those at the same time and then had two oil crises hit. And you can see the oil crisis is what really spiked those two things. None of those are happening right now. I just saw a note today, the Permian Basin's pumping about 5 million barrels a day. The US is up to 11 to 12 million barrels of oil a day and is effectively the marginal supplier of oil, all in a world where we are now able to create energy from fossil fuels, or sorry, from uh, clean 
uh, wind and solar cheaper than fossil fuels for the first time in history. So jury's uh, out there on the, uh, on the oil power in the market. However, Brian Westbury says that it's a monetary phenomenon, quoting Milton Friedman. So what we did is we put Brian to the test. The average M2, which is money supply, the average growth of M2 during that 1965 to 1980 period was 8.7%. And then we slammed it on a chart for 60 years. It is clear as day. The 1970s were really the only period where we had a sustained period of time of money supply growth above that. So he's right. Right now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to adjust this chart and I'm going to add in 2020 and 2021. And then we're going to take the orange line and make it be CPI just lagged a little bit. So you can see what happens when you spike money supply growth and then uh, the spike in inflation. And it is very, very clear. You spike the money supply growth, you spike inflation, spike blue, you spike orange. Look at that chart. I mean, would you, even if we called it right here, if we just stuck the line and said, we think it'll be 7%, it doesn't even go to the magnitude of the chart and still would make us uh, the most inflation forecasting uh, uh, firm basically on, on the street. But it's not all bad news, right? It's not all bad news because earnings and earnings margins tend to move with inflation. And so you get the strength of the US consumer ready to buy things. That means they're able to, and, and ready to pay for things with higher prices. So Apple's been increasing their, their prices for quite a long time. Here's a question for you on this call. Netflix just increased their price. Did you cancel? I'm guessing you didn't. And now we're gonna take this and move a little bit more to some specific areas uh, of the market. So what we've done here is we've plotted whose margins are expected to be the highest and then who plotted them against who's been able to grow them the most relative to where they were in 2019. I find it very interesting that the, the companies that are in the biggest, the best part of this chart, semiconductor, software, tech, and media, and entertainment are the areas that are being hit the hardest right now. So I wouldn't be as negative on those particular areas of the market. That's why we're so bullish on the digitalization uh, theme. And that's why we, we've got multiple ideas and ways to play the digital theme, some that have high growth and high valuations, like say a cloud computing um, or cybersecurity, or some areas of the market that are less, uh, less growthy, but much less valuation. So the 5G and, and um, next G idea that we have is a, a 19 PE. And so those are some of the areas where you can look 5G in this marketplace is going to get some of the most certain revenue profiles from the year. The telcos get about a trillion dollars a year worldwide, and they are going to be spending a ton of money last year, this year, next year, and the year after as they build out their 5G capabilities. So we'll cover that in a minute. Back to inflation. When interest uh, inflation is running above average, where should you be looking? It's pretty clear from the data. Go smaller, go more value. And then historically energy, but I'm going to skip that for a minute and just circle your attention right here. Financials are obvious. Uh, I lend long 30 year mortgage and I borrow short, right? CDs and deposit accounts. When Remember when they used to pay, pay interest? So as the interest rate curves or the longer term interest rates move up, banks are able to make more money. And that's why financials is a, a effectively a no brainer as this is happening. Then when you look to business equipment over the last hundred years, what, what would you say business equipment would look like moving forward? And that's where we're seeing, in our opinion, a lot of these digital ideas, cloud-based, uh, cloud-hosted web services, databases, things like that. And of course, everything that goes into the cloud has to be secured. That's one of the reasons why, even in spite of inflation, we're bullish on that. Now, energy, I said it just a moment ago, we're, it's not what it used to be. So 2014, 15, 16 really showed that when the US manages to affect the supply of the world, it really distorts these dynamics. Then you get to 2020 and wind and solar are now producing energy cheaper than fossil fuels. Jury's out. So I wouldn't just uh, close your eyes and buy some energy stocks without recognizing that the volatility might be a little, or the certainty uh, confidence interval, if you will, is gonna be a little bit less certain than say this chart would predict. So I hope that's clear. I, I like the top five, six things here. Healthcare is pretty much always a good opportunity um, for a bunch of reasons. Now the interest rates bit is the last part I'm gonna get into before I turn it back over to you guys. 
so that we can really dig into any questions you have um, across the board. I found this to be really interesting. So this is the second to last Fed fund hike, and it was after the 2000 tech bubble had cratered. And really more interesting to me is that it's an area where you had internet companies. So we're gonna look at some of those um, like you have today. And then this one as well. Now, when we look at this, I have found this to be just a fascinating chart because the way the, the pundits talk about tech and the 10-year treasury is that 10-year treasury up means tech has to come down. Well, then what happened the last time? So you see right there, that line is the 10-year treasury yield. And it went up about 75% in about a 90-day period. You'll see none of these stocks are negative. At the end of this chart, the 10-year treasury yield more than doubled. Other things that more than doubled, Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. The one that did the best is the most indebted growth stock anybody talks about and especially criticizes, which is Netflix. Netflix and Amazon start this chart with a 300 PE and are able to go up over 100 to over 200 percent while the Fed funds rate went from zero to two and at two and a quarter and the 10-year treasury went from about one one and a bit to two and a bit. So this chart makes me not that nervous right now and effectively um, nothing like this interest rate liftoff. Now this is giving you a much more traditional uh, response. So this is what everybody's expecting, and I wanted to give two sides of this. You can see that as it went from one to five, huge magnitude, that's nothing like what anybody's expecting. You can see that the value stocks did 37%, and the growth stocks did 16 Now note, 16 17% from growth stocks over three years, not a great return, but it's also not negative. And trying to time those longer term growth opportunities, like say, uh, in the electric vehicle space or the digitalization space is going to be very tough. And that's why instead of trying to balance that out with timing, we'd like you to balance it out with other portfolio exposures, particularly the quality and deep value stocks. Now, one other thing on here, Jamie Dimon thinks they're going to raise the Fed funds rate four times and we could swallow it. While we think they should, we don't think they're going to get more than two Fed hike hikes this year. They got to let the, some of this buying roll off probably won't get to it until March, six weekly schedule, they raise rates, you know, 12 weeks from March to, to mid-May, and then they're getting dangerously close to the summer and the midterm election. So are they able to get in three or four? We'll see. If they do, we're, we're fine with that. We think they should. But now let me show you something very clear. The multiples did not expand on value stocks, which means it was all earnings ex, uh, growth, which is excellent, but it means, this is why I want dividends to be part of people's value exposure. Because if you just buy something cheap and hope for it to go up, that's not as powerful as buying something that's giving you income and then increasing that distribution. So we love companies that uh, pay more and more out. You'll note this pretty strong multiple contraction though on the growth side. We do, we do expect that you're seeing that right now live, right? Now, I wanted to see can you still buy high valuation tech stocks in the face of a sizable Fed funds hike? And this is what I found was really interesting. We have a model that we like to uh, that we like to build. So, so what we did is we went back and said, what would have helped us to buy Amazon in say 2005? Uh, sorry, 2015. Its PE ratio was non-existent, and then was 1,200 and then uh, came down to 800. It was one of those companies that had never made any money, but obviously was a great return. And so what we came up with is a very simple model, anecdotal evidence and sales growth. So what, what we wanna do is look at our own life, look at your life, your kids' lives. And if you realize you're talking to everybody, whether it's your spouse or your kids or a stranger in the line at the grocery store about a show you're watching on Netflix, go check out its sales growth. If it's doing well, then move to the next line, check out their profit margins and their cash flows or earnings per share developments. They don't have to be positive. The reason I'm, I'm walking you through this, 2004, everyone was buying iPods, creating Gmail accounts. I literally thought of two stocks and they worked. And I'm, I'm so excited to show you this because this is just unbelievable. In the face of that Fed funds hiking rate, Apple goes up 490%. Google is a tech IPO and it goes up 440%. In fact, 
throughout this chart, Apple starts with a 120 PE and Google starts with a 200 PE. High valuation, tech IPO, tech stocks, still able to make money in those rising rates. Does that mean go headlong into these high valuation names? No. What it means is leverage what you have here, which is a genius financial advisor, and ask them to help you find the areas of growth in the markets that still meet with your risk uh, return, your risk, um, kind of your risk assessment. Now, one last point on this: rates are <laughs> rates have gone even more negative. So they were negative to start last year, and then they've gone even more negative. The only other period on this chart where you can see was a sizable period of negative interest rates led us right into the taper tantrum, which also was a massively bullish moment for stocks. Uh, there's a fund strategist that I'm sure you guys have seen on CNBC, uh, Tom Lee, who works at FundStrat. He talks about the history of stock returns when real rates are negative, and they're very, very good. But we're simply talking about a 52-50 rate. So I'm going to end here by just giving you the uh, the last bit of why we're constructive on 52.50. We're at 52.50 by taking the profits companies in the S&P 500 pay taxes on, and then we divide that by a 10-year treasury. That gives us our model. Another way to get there is just the 70-year average, 11%. That gets you to 52.50. Another way to get there is take all the analyst price targets, put them in a consensus, which is what FactSet does, and do a weighted average. That gets you to 52.48. Another way to get there is to look at the earnings expectations of all the different companies, and that gets you to 217.65 with a 24 PE, which is not cheap, uh, it's a slightly cheaper than where it is right now. That gets you to 52.23, and then this gives you something to play around with. If you think it'll be higher or lower, that's where you can play with it. And then you've got $240 a share with the super bullish JP Morgan has. So at a 20 PE, that gets you to a 4800, which would be slightly above where we are right now. So landing the plane, we have to recognize there are a sizable amount of companies in the NASDAQ that have PEs that are over 30. Now, one thing is very important. If interest rates matter, the Fed funds rate was five over here. Over here, we don't think it'll even get to three. So even if it's at two and a half, does that kind of make sense? Because if the interest rate's lower, your valuation should be higher. This is another reason why you might not have to be as uh, negative on these areas. And then you look at the earnings growth from tech, from communication services, where you're getting your Facebooks and your Netflix and your Googles, from the consumer discretionary part, part where you're getting your uh, Home Depots, your Amazon, your Teslas, your Nikes are in that bucket. And the forecasts are actually for pretty strong earnings. And of course, this lines exactly up with the, the strength of the US consumer. But first trust is much more about factors than we are um, sectors. And when you look at the factor chart, quality just has been historically the best performing factor. What's interesting about that is they've been the best performing factor without ever really being the best. Now, for those of you that are soccer fans, this will make more sense uh, uh, unless you're NHL fans. So effectively what this is, is quality has won the most points without ever really winning the championship, right? But the key here, especially as to buying right now, is that quality is really never uh, in the bottom. They, they're the only factor that's never not been in the bottom two buckets in the 24 years of data. And all quality is, is return on equity. So I'm just gonna make sure I explain this really quickly. Right um, here, return on equity is net income divided by the capital structure. Net income is sales minus expenses, right? That is going to be self-governed by inflation. Warren Buffett said to focus on return on equity in one of his famous shareholder letters in 1977. So we, I just really like to focus on the fact that quality as return on equity is a great factor to use right now. It shows a tremendous amount of downside protection in the stock markets. And then the last point here is which factors do well while interest rates go up. What you can see again, value stocks, smaller cap companies, and then our uh, call to still be constructive on growth and quality is borne out right here. As you can see, quality doesn't really matter, and it also doesn't really matter for momentum. You've pivot this to correlations, and you're back to looking for smaller cap yield stocks, quality stocks again, sitting there in the middle.
So we'll just end the my, that bit right here. And Keith, team, I'd love to take questions, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for letting me blab on about the U.S. economy. Keith, you're on mute. Mute again. Uh, thanks again. Am I off mute now? Yeah. Uh, th thanks again, Greg, for for your time. I, um, I think um, you know you you raise some interesting points there, and and you talk mostly here so far about uh, you know the U.S. economy. Our questions, given a little bit of our audience, are a little bit more global. Uh, we might say in in focus. But um, before we get to, I think one of the the chief ones there. Um, you know, one of the questions I think that everybody has is we've started the the year so poorly. Um, you know, given inflation and COVID concerns, uh, interest rates, um, you know, should we play it safe for a few months? And you know, what what, what do you think of that sort of idea? Yeah, I, I agree with that idea. That's that's my first. If somebody said, "Give me one thing to buy," it would be quality stocks. And the reason for that is because of this obsession of trying to pick growth or value, quality has been largely left for dead. Um, I actually have a chart to show you on this. So this is one of Warren Buffett's favorite and most famous stocks in history, right? You always see him holding a, um, a Diet Coke, right? And what I've done here is I've plotted the, the P-E ratio of Coke relative to the P-E ratio of the S&P 500. So if it's above the line, it's more expensive. And what you can see is that in, in 30 years, it's pretty much always been more expensive than, than uh, the S&P, except in the last two years, it's actually started to be about as cheap or cheaper. So we have a, a quality portfolio that I know you guys are familiar with. And the quality portfolio PE is actually below the S&P 500. That's not normal. So usually you have to pay up for these safer securities. And that's one reason why right now I would absolutely encourage if you're allocating today, uh, to allocate to the quality side of the market or the quality, the value side of the market with strong dividends. The only point I'm making as it relates to the nasty beatdown that we're getting on the tech side, if you have an allocation, I, I think we're still longer term constructive on it. And if you're looking to allocate, it's either about waiting a little bit for some of this to shake out or starting to dollar cost average into those stocks as it relates to earnings. Because that's the biggest thing. If these company like Zscaler, which is a cybersecurity stock, got upgraded yesterday. Uh, the, the analyst came out and said he's expecting 40% cumulative annual growth at the business over the next five years. If that happens, I, I just can't see that company not doing well. But that doesn't mean they're not going to have a quite volatile period for the, until, the, until this market starts to value. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so we've focused here, and I think it's a, a good question to kind of hinge and, and shift. Um, to talking maybe a little bit more about global markets as well. Um, one of the things we've seen over the last 10 to 12 years, 14 years, in fact, is U out, U.S. outperformance, one of the longest periods of U.S. outperformance uh, against the rest of the world. And, you know, one one case could be made that there's a lot of quality to be found in the, in the rest of the world. But what are the, why did we see so much outperformance uh, in the last sort of 14 years? And, and what are we seeing in terms of of shifting, you know, going forward. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, given this was a U.S. macro, I did I did leave that out, so I apologize for that. What one of the areas outside of the U.S. that does look really constructive are U.K. equities in particular, but European equities in general. Um, but one of the reasons why the U.S. outperformed for so long was a, a couple. I'm just going to throw a couple different points at you. Once they lowered the tax rate, the U.S. has the sixth lowest tax rate in the G20. You've got Switzerland at 15, the UK, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are at uh, 19 and 20, and then the US is there at 21. So when you have the largest single market, one of the lowest tax rates, 60 to 70% of the highest ranked academic institutions in the world, the best innovative center in Silicon Valley, possibly the number one or at least one of the top financial centers, the two top biotech centers in the world, it starts to stack up on itself why the US has outperformed. And as you're kind of hearing, none of those are really going away right now, especially with uh, the Democrats locked in an internal struggle here. So it doesn't look like they're going to end those tax rates anytime soon. And we're, that's why we're still largely constructive on the US. But if you look US, Europe, and UK, 
the UK stock market's the only one that's actually far below its historical PE. So if you are looking for some areas, they, the European stocks are being, are effectively part of that value rotation, right? So if you're selling US tech stuff and you're seeing companies in the US like JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway that are continuing to rally, the, the European markets in general are, are caught up in that as well for exactly the reason you just brought up. Um, anything uh, as well sort of related to that, um, you know, one of the reasons as well is that uh, sort of over the last 14 years as well, the dollar has generally been stronger than than the rest of the world. And so in local currency terms, many times returns have been better. Um, but it's also something, you know, related to your point about housing as well, that some of our clients are, are thinking about as well, if they're moving to the, you know, UK or Europe, uh, how will the the strength of the dollar, you know, affect their ability to buy a house there or that sort of thing. And I guess, uh, you know, from a, a bigger picture, anything beyond, you know, explain maybe why interest rates are going to be so crucial for that discussion, but anything else that, that folks should pay attention to beyond um, interest rates, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Let me go to Brian's uh, slide here, because one of the points that he's making, and he gets that question every time he comes over here. <clears throat> uh, so if we're looking here, like we can use this one. There, there's two ways to look at it. Obviously, the context of the of the presentation that we're talking about is inflation, right? So inflation is making a currency worth less, but it's always on a relative basket, right? So we saw we saw five percent inflation out of the eurozone and five percent inflation here in the UK. That's not that's not even close to the case. Yesterday, the German Bund went positive. So we've got some really interesting things happening in the yield markets. And so the two most important things that will drive the US dollar are going to be the relative interest rate and the relative amount of inflation. It looks like, because of a whole bunch of reasons, the US ran the, the printing presses a lot faster. The UK came in number two because they are fiscal and monetary uh, unions. Right. Then you go to the European Union where you have a, a fiscal union, sorry, a monetary union, but multiple different fiscal uh, policies. And so that just make, made that a little bit more of a, a laggard in that bucket. So at the moment, in the next couple of years, we probably would see the inflation on the dollar lower. But because of that, you're going to get paid to own the dollar more, which will effectively make the whole conversation move. But you want to walk that through, because if any of those things change, um, that's what's really crucial. So what's happened in the 2018 scenario was that the dollar ended up, or the the yield on the dollar, the, the Fed funds, actually got so strong relative to the rest of the world that it, it effectively created a massively tight monetary policy for a couple for a couple of quarters there. And that's what broke a bunch of really interesting things, but they fixed it within a quarter. <clears throat> so all to say watch whatever country you're living in because it sounds like you guys have clients all over the world watch the yield on your country and the yield on the 10-year and then the relative inflation print from the most recent month will probably be the best indication of what to expect for the next year um one uh, um sort of thing that we we've kind of uh touched on and i think maybe big picture we've talked a little bit about europe um and and what about China and, and Asia, um, you know, and also, you know, uh, some of our questions as well relate to, um, you know, Chinese markets going forward, Asian markets going forward, but also the tech sector specifically, if we're seeing, you know, you know, what we're seeing in the U.S., we're raising, uh, rising interest rates, you know, will still, you know, will maybe dampen growth a little bit, but we should still see growth are similar things at play in Asia as well. Yeah, it's hard to slow down the growth that's happening in Asia. However, shooting yourself in the foot is one way to do it. Now, <laughs> what the Chinese government is clearly trying to do is correct the kind of clean out the closet so that they can return to growth in a more sustainable manner or in a more maybe not in a sustainable manner manner for shareholders, but in a more sustainable manner to what the, the, the CCP is trying to accomplish. As it relates to China, let, let's just separate Chinese stocks and the rest of, and the, the rest of Asia. Southeast Asia is set to grow. It, it is clear they are going to continue to advance on the back of these digitalization and cleaner energy uh, innovations worldwide. That will continue to drive 
global growth and global growth will be led out of Asia. The next area is supposed to be Africa, but like uh, a lot of things we've heard, that's been the case for a long, long time. So when it gets to China, you had mentioned soccer earlier, and soccer has been the sport of the future in, in the United States since 1974, right? So <laughs> yeah. kind of the same kind of concept, right? Make that happen. But then Freddie Adu turned in a, a Daniel Radcliffe, and when, when Harry <laughs> Potter didn't end up growing, it, it they had to just put him in the character uh, for the last couple of movies. Anyway, I agree with that. But the point is on China. So let's just give a couple of things. And this is where having a financial advisor is key. So please talk to your team at Walkner Condor to, to prove this out. But if Charlie Munger is buying Alibaba, I'm sure Charlie Munger has looked into the legality of what happens if the ADR switches or delists or things like that. So that and these variable interest entity issues, um, they are risks, but they seem to be digestible risks. But again, please check with your, your financial advisor to see how that works for yourself because you can buy these things local. Uh, let me just talk about Alibaba for a second. Alibaba has a PE ratio below Unilever. That's ridiculous. We all know why and when the market will be allowed to kind of have that sort of Damocles removed, we have absolutely no idea. But if you look at Alibaba, which is the Amazon of China, it's hard to imagine that stock whose internal businesses are growing 30 to 40 percent doesn't continue to grow. Right. And the, the gap where you've got Amazon at a trillion and Alibaba now at 150 billion, it just it just doesn't stack up. But we know the risks there. And so if you're willing to allocate there, those are a couple, you know, they say punt in the UK. Those seem like a, a couple of good punts on, say, Chinese tech as a basket, not necessarily one individual area or more broadly, I think just Internet or digital businesses. Um, for that area of the world is, is key. There's a couple other companies that you might want to take a look at, um, like C Limited is a, is a company you might have heard of. That is actually the Amazon of Southeast Asia. And so it's just it, businesses like that are just so interesting. And then in the context of uh, China versus Asia, I would never want to play that game. Um, I wouldn't know that. But what we do know, and this is going to tie into something I think you're going to ask me about a question in a moment. Emerging market local currency sovereign debt does seem to be like a really attractive, uh, a really attractive investment for a whole lot of reasons. Whatever the Chinese are doing, one thing they're probably, or at least the last thing they'll ever do, is default on their sovereign currency and things like that. So that's one of the reasons we think that's a great risk mitigation tool for your for your fixed income portfolio. Yeah, and well, that, in fact, question that we have is, what what are you seeing in the international bond markets, right? We, we, you just mentioned that the Bund is, has gone positive, which hasn't been the case for quite a while, uh, you know, emerging markets, uh, that sort of thing. You know, the currency question comes up a little bit more if you're, you know, abroad a, as well. And, you know, one way that you can get currency exposure is by uh, you know, moving out of just U.S. Treasury. So, what what are you, what's your read on on the international bond markets? You know, kind of going forward. Yeah, I th I think I'm much more constructive on non-traditional fixed income than traditional, and it's just because the yields are so low. So even even U.S. high yield right now is at is four percent nominal, so negative three percent yield. It's it's worse when you get, when you get into Europe. Um, so that's why I think if that's going to go back to your kind of your client base. And again, why you need a financial advisor. So if you're in Europe and you have euro denominated retirement needs, there might be a bigger reason for that. But if you're just simply allocating for growth with a, with a global portfolio in mind, um, I, I, I just see European sovereign local currency as such a strong item here. And again, sovereign bonds, not corporate bonds. Sovereign bonds in local currency, the default rate should be very low, especially if you go with a manager that you know buys investment grade. Because the yields on that are about five, let me just show you how I think about this world. If I'm getting a two and a half percent yield on investment grade bonds or a one percent yield on German five-year treasuries, then I can set, let's just say, uh, make the math easy. Let's say I'm getting two and a half on a 10-year treasury. I can sell that, 
put half of my allocation in cash and put half of my allocation in that emerging market local debt piece and the yield to me is the same but my my value at risk has dropped in half and my ability to allocate to bonds at a higher rate due to rising interest rates has just gone up so that's why i like again like uh, emerging market sovereign debt pretty much alone i also like preferreds um, because I think of the same thing. They give you a higher yield, about five, six percent. A lot of them have interesting structures, variable rate, fixed to float, and they're backed by largely financials, whose, as we've covered earlier, their credit gets stronger with rising interest rates, which makes them a very different part of the fixed income market. So any questions that you wanna jump in with there? I think we got to almost all the questions from the audience. We also had a question. I know, Greg, you touched on clean energy as one of the themes that you, you've been looking into. Uh, we did get a question on climate change and the extent to which uh, it represents a, uh, a geopolitical risk and also a, a, a risk to investors and you know uh, maybe how that impacts your investment thinking a little bit and some of the themes that you're seeing in that space we'd, we'd love to hear your comments on that yeah um let me break climate change down into the theoretical and then into the stock market uh, element <clears throat> so go back to earth day right 1979 the talking points haven't changed and i'm going to link it to a question i got once from a 78 year old Israeli immigrant to the UK. And he asked me, were, was I worried about conflict in the Middle East disrupting my economic forecast? And I said, uh, no, but respectfully, when has that not been a risk? Right? And, and he was like, good point. So geopolitical risks are always on the table. In the last couple of years, obviously more right now from Russia, and just I'm getting back to the climate change thing. So Having these climate-related risks since 1979 brought to the forefront, Jimmy Carter in the White House, right? These have been palpable concepts. However, they haven't materialized yet into anything that you can translate into the into a, an investment portfolio. So we're the only thing that's happened is that governments are now acting on that more with real spend. Okay, so I wouldn't for one minute try to predict how to port how to position your portfolio if uh the ocean floods into los angeles right i just don't think it's it's worthwhile but what i would say is you can look at how the governments are reacting to these numbers by spending trillions and trillions of dollars and in my opinion the biggest clearest growth opportunities <clears throat> excuse me in the near term are electric vehicles where we're gonna sell 250 million electric vehicles in the, just in this decade. Tesla can only make one. So every electric vehicle made will be sold in the next decade. That's always a good problem to have if you're buying stocks. And then on the other side, I like smart grid investments. We, we just think the grid has to change. And the way I heard an expert say this the other day, if Thomas Edison showed up right now, he would understand our grid. And that's not a good thing. If, if the guy that founded IBM, Thomas Watson, showed up right now, you handed him an iPad, he'd like fall on the ground because it'd be the, he'd blow his mind, right? So the grid has to change because of how we're consuming, how and where we're producing energy. And, and that's why when anytime you get that forced investment, it's a great opportunity to invest. And those two things represent a really high volatile investment, electric vehicles, right? or a lower volatile, lower valuation opportunity, which is more on those kind of um, LEDs and smart meters and things like that. So anything else uh, related to, to geopolitical risks or, you know, uh, one thing that's dominating the news and geopolitical risk, uh, you know, China and Hong Kong and, and Russia and Ukraine, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this, before um our call today and and you know why you know china seems to be less of the of the risk um than than russia but um you know what are you seeing and how might that play out for international markets you know over the next you know stretch yeah that's a good point china china's actions are affecting chinese securities russia's actions are affecting global securities 
that's an oversimplification, but it's a it's a good way to think about it, right? So Alibaba is super cheap because of what China's doing, whereas <clears throat> oil's elevated probably because of what Russia's doing. And this is the way from I've talked to some Chinese people who are very connected with their their uh, relatives in China and kind of the geopolitical issue. They're not thinking that anything's really going to happen. The biggest geopolitical thing with China that you you uh, didn't mention there was maybe them invading Taiwan. That would be a big problem right? Especially with a semiconductor shortage and Taiwan semiconductor being there, but they still want to sell stuff. So just be mindful of that. So here's the way to think about it. It's a tail risk, but it's a tail risk you can think about. Neither one seems likely to happen. However, the closer you get to the midterm election, just think if you're playing chess, right? If you were going to do those, you do them close to the midterm election because it would really it would put Washington in quite the bind. Um, once you pass that, if nothing happens before the midterm election, then I'd be even less expecting that something happens after the midterm election. I, again, if Russia invades uh, Ukraine, I would be I would then be more constructive on energy stocks, just because that would be a very big disruption on on the the areas. I hope that would mean you haven't missed it yet, but the price of oil is going up, um, whereas the energy stocks would pr probably be more uh, more solid in terms of their ability to monetize a longer term uh, price, rather than what I think might be happening right now is because of the Russia buildup, you've got energy prices increase. Because what I'm reading on two sides is Russia invading and supply is continuing to, to ramp up in the U U.S. So once that's we've seen this before, right? The U.S. supply starts to hit to a point where it overtakes the global uh, demand. And so once America just consumes all of its own oil, including Canada and Mexico, the oil price should roll over unless there's some sort of longer term issue with that. But that this is more that's just me pontificating. <laughs> <laughs> some of those well, we should probably uh, wrap things up there, uh, uh, Greg, because I know you have another uh, call here. Uh, shortly coming up. So appreciate your time this morning. Appreciate Will for for putting it together and and Dan uh, Corcoran a, as well for uh, the technological help for all of us. Uh, really appreciate it, Greg. And um, you know if we get uh, further questions from our clients, you know we'll be uh, uh, certain to rely on your expertise a, as well going forward. So we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Send them over. We're always happy to help uh, answer those questions. All right. Well, appreciate it. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Greg.